Hello, everybody. Happy August 11th, 2020. My name is Christopher Saunders, and this is the Connecticut Sports Talent Show, where we talk all things talents in Connecticut. Uh, on today's show, I have another head coach for the high school girls basketball side. I know we've talked about football, we've done boys basketball, but now we have girls basketball, and I have the head coach, Joe Fortier, who is the head coach of the Pomparat Girls Basketball Program. Joe, it's great to have you on. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You know, I think, you know, as always, before I talk about the program and everything that goes with that, I, I kind of want to know about yourself as far as your journey and kind of, because you're a Woodland guy, you teach there, you've been amongst the coaching as far as various sports with soccer, boys basketball and softball, but just kind of take me into your background a little bit. Well, my first year out of college, I actually taught in New Haven, started at uh, JV baseball for career high school. And uh, I was 22, just young, and I knew I wanted to get in coaching. I played baseball in college, and so I just wanted to get involved being a phys ed teacher. When I got to Region 16, uh, which is Prospect Beacon Falls, I was teaching at the elementary school, and that was back in 2001. And Dan Scavone was the athletic director at uh, Woodland High School. And he just said, you know, you, know, you want to be a head coach someday, take up the opportunities, be JV coach, be assistant coaches, um, you know, get yourself in the door and, you know, don't say, basically don't say no to anything, you know, try to help out at Woodland as much as I could. Uh, so I took over my first coaching job there was freshman boys basketball. And um, as I was leaving that day for getting paid, they asked me if I could help out with softball. And uh, I had a 10 game package to the Red Sox at the time. And I was like, eh, he goes, no, we'll work around. And we ended up going to the state finals that year. Um, and, you know, I ended up staying, I think, seven or eight years there as assistant coach for Lauren Luddy. Um, and she was also, at the time, the head soccer coach. So I went over and helped her for girls soccer. And when she stepped down from girls soccer, I became the uh, head coach at Woodland for girls soccer. And that was about six years there. Um, stayed at Woodland for basketball. All the way up to one year at Oxford, I did before I took the uh, Pomparel Gross basketball job. Was there anything in particular, you know, in particular that kind of jumped out for you going from, you know, career and then going back or going to Regional 16, which is Woodland High School? Because I know sometimes when you go from one program to another, there's going to be, I don't know if, it, if you know, adjustment is the right word but maybe kind of seeing a different culture, maybe seeing uh, different athleticism, different play. Was there anything that you noticed amongst those two? Uh, yeah, you know, the involvement, you know, parental involvement is a little bit different, you know, from career high school to, to uh, career high school too is a unique situation for baseball because the field's not at the school. Mm -hmm. um, you drive to East Rock. So you kind of get out, you get on the highway from the school. Um, so, you know, the kids need a little bit more help. In that aspect, you know, not all, all of them drive. Whereas, you know, at Woodland, you see more people driving and more transportation. So, kind of, you're involved a little bit more in that aspect too. Um, it was a big jump from just being. Then I kind of did girls, you know, so boys baseball. And then I kind of got into the girls. So, it's obviously a big jump that way as well. How about the fa or not family aspect, but the parents aspect? Because I've done a lot of Woodland games for um, for football for the last few years, and their football program. I mean, especially the last two years with Coach Moffa and what he's done. I mean, you think about it, uh, Belinsky, the, who was a star quarterback, now going to Anna Maria, will not be playing, sadly, this fall because of COVID-19. You know, there's a lot of talent on that roster. And being able to broadcast the game and seeing the energy from the crowd, they're in those games, man. So was that the same thing for both soccer, basketball for the boys' side, and for softball, too? Being at Woodland and Pomparog, I've been lucky. You know, those, uh, those regions are very passionate about their sports and very involved. Um, and I think that's a big part of their success. Uh, yeah, girls soccer, you go to a Woodland Holy Cross game, a Woodland Naugatuck game, and it's packed. You know, the crowd, night games. Um, and I, it's just, I always talk to my athletes, you know, especially now with basketball the past years, is those are the types of games you remember. You know, for us, it's Pomparog, Newtown, you know, the state tournament games. And, back when you have those energy and Woodland kind of brings that, you know, nightly, you know, for their sports, you know, you go to a baseball game on a Saturday, you'll get a good crowd. And, uh, uh, softball is the same way. They had a lot of people up on the Hill watching the games. Um, it, it, it 
they stay on top of their kids to get them involved. And then they have a lot of energy and it's a lot of fun for everybody. Um, it, it's, it's kind of why I grew up in Thomaston where it's that way. Uh, when they were in the state finals, I think the towns would shut down to go watch the games. Um, and it's kind of why I want to be involved. It's so much fun to be a part of those things. It's great to have that energy, you know, to be able to have that involvement with the community, you know, with the players who are passionate. And it kind of, in some ways for you, Coach, especially with you starting out when you were just beginning, you know, soccer coach, you were baseball coach of career and going through your progressions, I almost feel like in some way being at Woodland prepared you for Pomperag because you were going from a well-established, you know, parents involved, there's a lot of energy, and then you go to Pomperag, and like you mentioned, it's kind of the same thing. Parents are involved, there's a lot of talent amongst the players, but it in some ways prepared you for the job at Pomperag. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and I would think girls soccer in particular at Woodland prepared me for girls basketball at Pomperag. Uh, girls soccer at Woodland's one of those perennials where they're usually, I mean, even on a down year, they're probably talked to finishing the top three of the NBL, top four of the NBL. Uh, yeah, down, you know. Down so <laughs> for, them, for them to be that passionate about the sport, I go to Pomperog and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, we had the most, my, this was, in my 10 years, I think this was my worst record. And we were 16 and seven. And in the quarterfinals for Class L. Um, so to, ha to have a pro program that's so passionate and so uh, on top of it and, and already have that built-in culture of success, Woodland helped girl soccer help me for Pomperol ba basketball. So up a little bit notch because the bigger class, the, the, you know, we play the Notre Dames and those types of the league or the state. So it's up a little bit, but it's definitely prepared me for it. 16-7, down year. I'll take that every yeah. year. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's a down year, but you might get some critics that say it. <laughs> hey, you know what, Coach? I mean, you've really done a fine job with Pomperog. I mean, I was able to go back, you know, your history since you've been with Pomperog. And beyond the fact of what you've been able to help produce, both as far as collegiate players, but just the young women who go out and kind of do great things after they graduate from Pomperog and even from college as well, you know, I can kind of see the, the, you know, the red carpet, I guess, is probably the right word as far as being able to bring these young women into what is and has been a very successful post Pomperag career. Yeah, we've, we've been lucky. We've had a lot of since I so this my this was my 10th year. I think I have nine times we had a person named all state um, and going on to play in college. Um, like you said, we were talking earlier, Carly Opaka is right now having a great career at Roger Williams. Um, uh, Hannah Metcalf was at Babson. Lauren Rubenstein, who she had some little issues with her ACL, so she had a couple years here and there where she had to sit out. She was at Brandeis. Uh, Gabby Holness was Illinois Wesleyan. You know, I, I we've had a lot of players go on to college. A lot of, what I like to see, Maggie Lee right now at Wesleyan, who's having a great career over there. Um, she, um, you know, she comes back, they get involved, and it's nice. The culture was kind of, you know, the Pop Rogue's been winning for a long time. Before I got there, they'll win after I leave. And it's because of that culture in the district that's, and girls basketball in particular, that's used to being successful. And, and my, my, my girls go to the Little Swishers, and they, they teach the camp, and those Little Swisher kids want to come up and play for Pop Rogue basketball. Those kids that are playing there now, I have pictures from them when they were playing in my halftime of my fifth, you know, when they were in fifth grade, mm -hmm. you know, so they just grow up wanting to be part of it. And I think because that culture is in place, I think they have that at Woodland too. Like the elementary school kids want to play for Woodland girls soccer. Mm -hmm. um, those programs, those are the programs that are consistently good every year because there's always the younger kids that want to come up and be like them. And the culture part, I want to get back to that in a second, but you mentioned about the low swisher kind of, giving back to the community, which is what it sounds like. And being able to do this podcast, having talked to various coaches, both in football, baseball, basketball, you name the sport. The biggest thing that I've heard a lot is giving back to the, you know, to the community. Because if you give back and you show support for them, they will support you either in giving you the talent and allowing you to be able to coach their young son or daughter, or just by being there at the games, which as you said, with Woodland and then now with Pomperog, giving the energy and kind of giving the young athletes 
a glimpse of what could be a playoff atmosphere. So in your opinion, do you think by giving back to the community as much as you have, you've been able to, in some ways, I don't know if give back to them is the right word because you're helping out, but I guess show in the product of what you're putting out there in the games. Well, I, no, well, I'd like to hope that they see me in there, uh, see me out in the community a lot. Um, you know, the parent and that they, you know, they notice it. Um, I know the kids really like it. Our high school kids really like it. Um, that we took, you know, it, we only have one day off a week during basketball season. That's a long season. Uh, we, you know, our Friday, SWC is tough because it's all over the place. You know, we'll drive to Weston. We'll drive to – and then so you're back late. Our little swisher says 8 in the morning on Saturdays, and that's our only day off. And my kids, they all show up, and they all do it because they're like, oh, we got little swishers tomorrow, right? And, and it's been good for them. And they talk about when they were at little swishers. They talk about how they used to be afraid of me when they were little, you know, and, and now they're not. <laughs> you know, now they don't listen. But uh, <laughs> I think it makes – I, I do think that, that that's uh, what makes a good program is that, that culture and that excitement and that people see, hey, he, he's going to be there. He's been there a long time. These, these kids come back and they work hard. And, and the little kids want to go see them play. They're like, oh, I love that coach. And they talk – I have a, I usually run a summer camp. I canceled it this year uh, mm -hmm. through Southbury Rec. Uh, and those kids come out you know, when they're younger and they're like, oh, I remember I had this as my coach. This person was my coach. And, it's it's that's what I love about sports you know it kind of draws everybody together and you just never know about who you're going to meet as far as who's you know as young as the camp is you know allowing to be able to come because I mean you hear about it or at least I do when I'm watching when COVID-19 is not happening as far as baseball or football and you hear about stories of you know a young college player who's in the pros or a young high school player who's in college who was helped out by a professional player or a high school player or whoever, and it kind of helped them as far as taking that next step as a young, as a young athlete. So it kind of, to me, seems like that's the same thing that's happening here, where you're giving back, you're helping, and who knows what that end result could be with the player that you're helping. Yeah, and I think, I don't know if it's every, you know, it's probably every kid, but I was going to say girls in particular, I've seen a lot where maybe they weren't the, uh, the best player in fourth and fifth grade. And mm -hmm. I would say Carly, Carly as an example, uh, Opaka was three time all state. When I had her in fifth and sixth grade for AAU, she wasn't as tall, you know, she worked hard. Uh, she did every camp, but she was probably like in the three or four. That's what, then she went as a freshman, she's starting, you know, she, you know, she took off something clicked, you know, someone worked, you know, someone, something clicked with her and she just took off. And, um, you know, when you're all state as a sophomore, you have a thousand rebounds and a thousand points, you know, someone's helped you along the way, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's great to hear that. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I think people kind of lose sight of that. I think people just think, Oh, coach has the players. He's either really good or the players are really good. And that's it. But no, there's more to it. I think, as you mentioned, and as we've been talking about for the last five or six minutes about being able to create that community, you know, cr uh, to create in some way, that community and being able to have that bond. And also too, the culture aspect. Now I've talked to a lot of coaches about what culture means to them and they've given me different reasons or different, I guess, um, different ideas of what culture is. So to you, what is culture? Well, I think it's the, I think the answer is becoming, our question is becoming more and more, um, on up front, more people are talking about this every year. Uh, when I first started coaching, I was more concerned about X's and O's and and press breakers, and I spent all the time on that and didn't spend enough time on culture. And in the last few years, that's been a focus of mine, uh, trying to make sure that they're having fun, uh, they're, we're together, we're doing team things. We do like um, we do a Super Bowl practice where they wear their jerseys on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, and we do dodgeball tournament and it's kind of take a step away from basketball, um, have fun with it, get a team bonding situation. Um, and those are the, the memories, you know, when you think about back to your high school sports, you, you remember the big games, you remember, uh, small little things. Uh, but those big, those events where you do like team bonding stuff is what really the bus rides and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So the last few, few years, I would say we, we focus a lot on tradition and, and trying to, 
duplicate different things that the, I let the captains kind of pick their own, like the seniors. What do you want to do rem your class to be remembered by? What do you want uh, for us to do to get us to be together? Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering it right, but uh, it's became more of a focus every year was culture and creating that stuff. Whereas normally, you know, my beginning career, I'd, I'd probably spend two and a half hours of practice on X and O's and go over it. Now I'd, now I'd be more apt to end it a half hour early and kind of do something fun with the kids. Um, try to keep, you know, a camaraderie of the team and, ha and have them be together more as a family. No, I get what you're saying, Coach, 100%. Just like, you know, I was talking with a former Holy Cross standout who's now the head coach at Anna Maria, Coach Malrooney. He told me he viewed culture as language. And I've talked to other coaches who viewed culture as work ethic or maybe, uh, you know, how they train. Like, there's various ways. There's not, you know, just like how you can view a, a particular sport and there's not going to be a right answer because viewing the sport, there's so many avenues. The same thing with culture. And I think for you to be able to kind of, and that's where the progressions for you as a coach, taking that next step and realizing, okay, I don't have, I don't have to go 150% from the beginning until the end, because that's how you kind of burn out the athletes. So now you let, you know, you allow them a little bit of time, you get the bonding, you kind of decompress a little bit from what it is probably, I mean, I haven't been to your practices, but I'm sure they're intense, but then you give them time to now just relax, get their mind off basketball. And who knows, maybe in a pressure situation or in a playoff game at the end of the season, that time that you took off during practice during the regular season, you can now save that energy for the post and probably states as well. Yeah, definitely. I needed to learn that, not run as much, you know, take a little, not have intense practice all the time. Uh, communication is huge too. You know, you were saying a little bit about talking. Um, so we, we actually implemented every like four or five games, we, we have coaches meeting, coaches, players meetings. Um, I used to do a handshake every day you left the gym, you had to shake the coaching staff's hand, you know, and say thank you. We say thank you to them. And it's not, you know, it's not that we need to thank you. It's just a, you know, a way to end, you know, I, I may have yelled at you for something in practice. We may have disagreed. That's mm -hmm. your time to kind of have some closure if you have to want to talk. And then every four or five games, we would, um, you know, we'd usually do it on a Sunday. We'd meet in the, after practice. We'd end it a little bit early. They'd come in one at a time and we'd talk. And it's their time to say, you know, because and, and there's always going to be ups and downs. There's always going to be disagreements on a, in a sports event. You know, people are going to want a bigger role. People are going to want more playing time or wish, you know, wh whatever, you know, and, and that's, I found out that was more important sometimes than spending an hour, extra hour on a man to man. It's just kind of opening it up and making them feel comfortable enough to, that they can talk to you. Cause a lot of times high school kids will say, Oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Until the end of the season. And they're not really fine. You know, mm -hmm. so you got to try to create an environment where they're going to feel okay to, to actually talk to you and actually say, Hey, what can I do to get better? And did I, how come I was out of the game in that situation? And I want them to not to be able to take that, ask that question, but also be able to take the answer when I say, Hey, you know, you, you just weren't struggling. The other person, you know, not take it personal. You know, sometimes it's, you know, it's hard for a high school kid not to take it personal because they, they want to play so much or, you know, just, just like anyone, no one wants to hear why, you know, the negative things, you know, they just want to hear the positive, but the negative yeah, but. is kind of what helps the positive because you're trying to be able to help them. And I think, you know, looking at what you've been able to do for Pomperog, I mean, the wins are there, the playoffs are there, everything has been successful. The only, I guess, the state, you know, the only downside is you faced, you know, Coach Treadwell at hand, who he's built a very strong program there. Also, Coach Russell at Weathersfield, who, coincidentally enough, I both have had on this podcast. And they're both very intelligent guys, but in their own different way. Coach Treadwell is a little bit wacky, a little, a little, he's funny, but he's yeah. very smart when it comes to the game. And then Coach Russell, I found to be very analytically driven where he goes with numbers, but it's not like, like, I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but yeah. yeah. So, you know, when you hear certain statistics that these guys throw out, you're like, what are you talking about? But the way that Russell speaks the analytics, he makes it very easy, I think, for the players to be able to understand. So when you go up against those guys, do you almost feel like you kind of have to up your game just like how the players have to up their game? Well, you know, I don't know if it's lucky or unlucky. The SWC is loaded with uh, great coaches, mm -hmm. uh, some of the better, you know. So we're, we're going in daily and nightly against uh, great teams. So, you know, you got even a bad, you know, even a, 
I don't want to say bad team, but even a team that may not, you know, be a 500 team, they're going to have some, you're going to, they're going to be well coached, I feel. Uh, so I used to spend a lot of time on scouting and uh, spend most of the practice on scouting and, and breaking down what should we do to, to, you know, OC likes the Newtown coach, likes to go down the right sideline. He likes to print choices. And we'd spend a lot of time on it. Um, then I started to feel that the more time I spent on it, sometimes they get a little more confused. So I tried to find – so my last four or five years, I really just kind of focused, first of all, on, on us. We're a team that likes to – we do a one two one one press. Uh, we play a lot of man – or man-to-man. -man. We don't – you won't really – very rarely will you ever see us play zone. Very rarely would you ever see a slow to game down. We're trying to d double up the other team's shots. So most of my practice is spent on doing drills like that. They don't know the running lines, but they're running lines and the drills we're doing. You know, everything's transition, defense, offense, uh, our press playing out of the trap. And then the last half hour or so, you know, we'll, we'll spend on our scout report. Or the last, I, I, not that I don't want to, that I'm not trying to pay attention to the other team. Not that I'm not. It's just I, I don't want to confuse my team. I feel like if you play our game and kind of tweak our game a little bit to maybe shut down, like uh, what's hand got the girl Sarah, Sarah Wagum. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Uh, she's probably out of the four years she beat me. Two, she beat us. She beat us in the semis and as a freshman, she beat us in the quarters as a junior. Uh, I'm kind of glad she graduated. Um, but, you know, we would spend time on what we wanted to do to her, not give her, you know, not give her space, try to slow her down a little bit. She's fast. Um, but, yeah, so I, I guess I, I'm not analytics. We do stats, but mm -hmm. we, we try to focus on – and we try to – you know, I used to do a lot of quick hitters and a lot of uh, continuity offense. Now I'm more like a five out, and we focus, like, what should we do? If in practice we'll focus on – Hey, the defense is sagging off on you. What should you do? Or hmm. how do you get open if they're playing real tight on you? Can you go back door? Can you get a screen? Um, and kind of give the them a little bit more freedom in their offense. I think the kids like to play that way, and then they don't have to remember what they have to do setting screens, and they don't have to remember, you know, where am I supposed to be on this play? I remember talking to Carly Opaka several times, and I'm like, Carly, you're getting the ball. That's all you got to remember. Like, stop trying to think about which play was which. You're getting the ball on the end of this. <laughs> So try, just try to make it like a fight, you know, try to have the kids do the same things every over and over again. So when you get into a big game and you get down the stretch, it's not, it's not going to be on me. It's not going to be a, hey, the coach won that game. Because that player made a great play. She just, she, she read the defense and she took it right to the hoop, you know? And, uh, and I think that's more of the, the way Pomperol plays. We usually play really high paced and our defense is usually, we try to keep teams under 40. Uh, last couple of years, I think we averaged, they averaged like 39 points against us, 38 points. Coach Fortier, it's great to be, you know, to have you on the show. You know, I got one more question for you before we end this, you know, and thank you again for being able to come on, you know, looking at kind of the program itself and how you've been able to run a very successful program. I'm sure there's been some sort of adjustment as far as how you view the players from your first year at Palm Parag to now it being, 2020, 2021, depending on if and when there's a season and so on and so forth. So the question I have for you, have you noticed the way the game has changed? Because I know for boys basketball, we were talking about Connor Tierney, who, if you look at the roster, he's a center, but he shoots threes. And, you're, you know, the NBA, because I'm sure you watch it, I mean, Damian Lillard from the Blazers, he's shooting half court. Trey Young is shooting half court. I mean, the what they're doing, you're having young men try to copy that. Is that the same for girls basketball? Are they trying to mimic certain things as far as shooting long-range shots or maybe not trying to, you know, basically what I'm saying is getting away from what's made basketball beautiful. Um, yes and no for me. Uh, yeah, I see it a lot in girls basketball. A lot more threes, a lot more wide open. And like I just said, I run the five out. A lot of teams are running five out, you know, somehow and just kind of driving, kicking. Driving, you know, driving to the – try to ram. If they don't have it, they kick out for a three. Um, the last year, I wouldn't say that we shot the three consistently. You know, we didn't really have a, a – my leading three-point shooter tore ACL uh, five or six games into the season. Um, 
so our our strength was getting the ball to the rim off of steals off of defense our our transition our fast break but we had some games where we had a 10 or 11 threes and for a team that doesn't have a three-point shooter a consistent three-point shooter that's a lot of i mean that's a lot of threes so yeah it's you would definitely see as a gym teacher as a phys ed teacher that's all they do they pick up the basketball they go to them they, they they shoot a three and yell kobe hey coach this uh, coach this is for you and then they break it off the backboard you know i'm like I was like, you know, if you're going to call and say it's for me, can you at least make it? Or an you know, so I, I think we, we want – we practice a lot of threes. We do some drills that we get, we're going to pull them out and do threes because mm-hmm. uh, it is part of the game and you're not going to – you're probably not going to get them out of that. I mean, even – you watch that Jordan documentary and you watch his mid-range game, mm-hmm. it, was, it was unbelievable. And you don't see that anymore. You don't see people use those mid-range jumpers in that. No. Except for Kobe, maybe Kobe was the last one that had it. But you know why they don't shoot that anymore? Because of analytics. Because now they're seeing that there's more – I guess they're somehow viewing that if you make two out of five threes, it's better than making X amount of twos. I mean, that's kind of what the game has started to become. And I almost feel like it's really just become it's, – it's like a half-court game. But, you know, even now, I know in college basketball, they moved the three-point line a little bit. But now you're starting to see guys shoot the ball from where they moved it because they're seeing tra- – you know, like I mentioned – Trey Young shooting from half court, Steph Curry shooting from half court. I mean, it's becoming one of those. Yeah, and they make it. But the point, you know, the point is, I think, you know, people, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it's a copycat league. And they think, okay, if the Warriors can do it, then I can do it. Or the Rockets can do it. And I almost feel like the game, I hope at some point, maybe I'm thinking old fashioned, but try to move back to what made the game beautiful working in the paint, trying to create plays and not just playing a bunch of ISO ball and having one guy shoot the ball 60 times. That's not fun. Yeah, that's, so you don't see that in girls basketball, not as much. Maybe Good. Notre Dame maybe this year, but that team was like an all-star team and they, they made yeah. them like 80% of the time. Yeah. Um, our, ours, you know, if you're in the flow of the offense, you'll shoot a three. Sometimes mm-hmm. you'll get, you know, maybe it's just my girls, but they miss their first couple shots. They don't want to shoot. You know, you're in PE class and you got boys, they'll, they'll miss 25 shots in a row and they still think they're Michael Jordan. They're like, give me the rock. Yeah, they're, they're like, I'm, I'm on fire, you can't stop me. Well, you, there's a reason why no one's guarding you, buddy. But uh, the, the, our girls, sometimes they kind of psych themselves out. So, I mean, if you watch us play, I, I wouldn't say we're a three-point shooting team. I think you're going to see – you would see we're going to get to – we're trying to get to the rim as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And that's – we're, we're up and down, so it's not usually a half-court game. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, the only time we played a half court game uh, was Notre Dame, and that was because they were so they were so yeah. up and down. If we went up and down with them, yeah. probably, we might have scored seventy points, but they would have scored ninety. So it, it was we ended up having a really good half court game, and that was when the girl tore ACL. Actually, she tore it in the first half. So I mean, that, that that's a tough you know that was a tough blow. <laughs> well. I was about to end the interview, but I almost feel bad that we're ending it on such a bad note. Yeah. But, <laughs> but Coach, Sorry. thank you so much, you know, for, you know, for being able to come on. It was a lot of fun oh. to be able to, you know, talk about the Pomperog program and being able to have yourself, you know, I'm an NBL guy, you're an NBL guy or a former NBL guy, but, you know, you're doing great things at Pomperog, and hopefully thank you me. guys can have a season. I wish you guys nothing but the best of luck. I appreciate it. I appreciate having girls basketball on too. You know, the more, uh, more publicity girls basketball can get would be great. Well, that's the thing. Like, I'm trying to get as many people as possible. I try to reach out. So I'm hoping, you know, between Coach Treadwell, Coach Russell, yourself, hopefully I can, I can get some coaches in the girls' basketball ranks to not be so shy and want to come yeah. on. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, it's good because, you know, you go to some, you know, I see a lot of games that are packed for boys. And then, you know, our the semifinal game against Hand uh, a couple years ago, I think it's 17. Um mm-hmm. uh, it was it was like a, a Sunday night, you know, a Sunday afternoon intramural game. You know, no one was there. I'm like, these are two of the better teams in the state, and yep. no one's there. Well, so it's nice to get more publicity. I'll do my best to be able to help out with that, Coach. I appreciate that. Thank you. Now, I'll wrap things up in the Connecticut Sports Talent Show. So, until next time, stay safe. Remember, CT stands for Connecticut Talent, and I'm on a journey to find them all. Have a good one, everybody.